Welcome everyone to Cheese in Depth, and I'm Michael Landis, and today we're talking with Mark Christensen with Dented Brick Distillery, and we're going to do some rum and cheese pairings that uh, are going to be fabulous. I have uh, been playing with uh, rum for a long, long time, and of course with cheese, and so I'm really happy to be able to put these two together, and also to be able to have the uh, privilege of being able to speak directly with Mark on this. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark for a little bit. He's going to talk about uh, Dented Brick Distillery. Mark? Well, Michael, thank you for having me on your show. Um, we've been making rum for a while. So we started uh, in uh, April of 2016. Our first product was a white rum. Uh, we ventured into uh, some aged rums. We started uh, aging white rum in a red wine barrel from one of my friends' wineries up in Idaho which is our Antelope Island Red you'll be tasting today, which we think is fantastic. Uh, we've gone on to do some flavored rums, uh, pineapple flavored rum. We just got a 94 rating and you'll be tasting that as well. And uh, finally, uh, we just uh, released a disco ball coconut flavored rum or disco nut. It actually has uh, edible glitter. So it's a pretty unique thing. You shake it up and I don't know if you can see it on the camera or not, but it's pretty cool looking stuff and it tastes really good. It's a lot of fun. It's only 25% alcohol, so it makes a nice uh, layered drink or mixer. And uh, hence all the disco balls and all the commotion behind me here. So I grew up in uh, Idaho in the wine region. So believe it or not, there's a wine region in Idaho, uh, the Snake River ABA. And my dad had an ag business there and we sold uh, pumps and water pumps and irrigation supplies. And we got into the dripper systems early on back in the, this was in the, I guess, early seventies, late seventies. And uh, in Idaho, when you're a kid, if you were, a, if you have a job, you can get a driver's license when you're 14. So I was all about getting a driver's license when I was 14. And so as a result, I was delivering uh, things to these wineries and um, getting to know a lot of winemakers and really interesting uh, business and interesting countryside out there. So. After I graduated from high school, my intent was to come to college. Uh, I came out to University of Utah and uh, get a degree out here and then go back and work in the wine industry. Uh, but rather than doing that, I ran into some kids from Park City, Utah and, and uh, really uh, took a, a liking to the ski industry here and, and skiing and ended up not going back to Idaho and working in the wine industry. And I started a barricade company of all things that uh, I started uh, when I was working for the marketing department in Park City. We were doing World Cup ski, ski race events and we needed barricades to get people to and from the parking lot. And uh, the sponsors wanted signs, so we invented this barricade that had a big sign panel on it. And uh, uh, that company's still in business today. In fact, after running that for 28 years, I was really uh, itching to get back into wine and uh, kind of came across the craft spirits industry. Got to know some friends up at High West Distillery in Park City, and they thought that uh, rather than pursuing a, a new career in wine, that I should pursue it in uh, craft spirits. And so I started studying it, uh, spent a lot of time in Kentucky, went to some schools in Washington, and uh, I decided to do it. So raised some money uh, to build this building in 2014-2015. Uh, uh, we built a uh, to almost, I don't know, 14,000, 15,000 square foot manufacturing facility. Uh, we built it from the ground up, so we didn't rent a building or rent a warehouse and try to put a distillery in it. It's actually been built to be a distillery, so we can dump hot air fluent right into the sewer system. Uh, we've got extra high ceilings in here for our column stills. We've got 28 feet column stills. Uh, and we also built the back of the building to be a rickhouse. So for those of you unfamiliar, a rickhouse, uh, particularly in Kentucky, is where they store the whiskey when it's finished in barrels while it's aging. And the trick to those is they don't have any heating or cooling in them. So they get really hot in the summer. They get really cold in the winter, which causes the alcohol to um, seep into the pores of the wood when it's hot, and then when it gets cold, the, that, that wood actually shrinks and pushes the alcohol out and it extracts the nail out of the wood. So the back of our building where the production is, uh, is very hot right now. It's 90 some degrees back there, but uh, the whiskey and the rum is all really pushing into the wood now. It's soaking into the wood. And this winter, it was when, it's, when it gets cold, that wood's gonna shrink and all that uh, uh, vanilla is gonna get extracted from that wood. And uh, after a couple of years, we should have some pretty tasty whiskey. We're gonna be bottling our first dry whiskey, in fact, um, shortly. So where'd you get your recipes? I uh, made them up mostly. Um, the, you know, the TTB, the government agency overseeing uh, alcohol has a, uh, a book of, it's like a menu book and it's 
you know, what you can do and what you have to call it. So like with whiskeys or like with bourbons, you have to have a certain amount of corn. It's got to be 51% corn. And then you have some sway in how much uh, wheat and how much rye. Uh, same with vodkas. Uh, gin's made from the vodka. Um, so the recipes are, are kind of already there in the beverage alcohol menu from the federal government. And then you can kind of adjust a little bit here and there. So we're trying to do uh, things that we can do uh, under the law, like our Antelope Island uh, red rum. That's actually a distilled spirit specialty because there's no uh, federal formula for Asian white rum in a red wine barrel. So uh, Antelope Island red is its official name. Uh, we're playing around with the glitter. We were allowed to do that. And with all of our flavored rums, we're using real fruit juices. Uh, we're not using artificial flavorings. Uh, and we think that makes a huge difference. They do uh, tend to have some sediment in them, uh, but it's like, kind of like a really nice wine where you get some sediment from the grapes. So we think the flavors are really spectacular, and a lot of the uh, ratings and tastings people think. I'm glad you brought that up. So it's a really interesting story. Um, as you know, you know Utah's the base of the Mormon Church, and the Mormons have lived here for years and years. Um, prior to about, I'm not sure when they stopped drinking, but somewhere around the turn of the century, but uh, I like Eris a little bit. Um, when the Mormons were still in Illinois, they had a town there called Nauvoo, and uh, Joseph Smith was still the head of the church. He sent Brigham Young and a guy named Heber Kimball on the first overseas mission to Liverpool, England. Uh, and of course, this was like 18, late 1840, early 1850s, so it's quite a trip to go from Chicago to the harbor in New York, sail a tall ship over to England, and then uh, start proselytizing. Uh, they were able to convert this entire family called the Moon family. And Hugh Moon was uh, the, the, the writing there that you see. His brother Henry, they were both literate and they both kept journals. So we have a complete history of this whole story of, of them converting to Mormonism, then traveling to Nauvoo, Illinois. Joseph Smith was killed there shortly after the Moon family got there. And they traveled on then to Utah. And Hugh was a distiller all this time. And so he has notes and stories about distilling here in Utah and selling his whiskey in Utah to the Walker brothers and to uh, members of the church. In fact, the back of the bottle, the human bottle, we have a quote from Brigham Young asking church members to only buy their whiskey uh, from, from church members. So kind of interesting. So now we're able to, we're taking a lot of this history and we weren't able to take any of these actual labels, but we're recreating a lot of these brands and re-releasing them. Our, uh, like I said, our first uh, two year age, 100% rye is gonna come out. It'll be called Moon's Best, uh, named after a few moon and, and the history. One of the really interesting things that we found it was very difficult to get a property in Utah. By federal law, you can't be within 500 feet of a church or a school. So there's really limited property to build a distillery out there. Uh, we finally found it. We were very lucky. The, the property had a, an artesian well. And it turns out the, the people that we bought the property from were using the little house that was here uh, as an office for their well drilling up there. And uh, so we have an artesian well, and you can see in the graphic here, it's not groundwater. They drilled all the way through the groundwater and hit the aquifer. So we're right at the base of the Wasatch Mountains uh, and a really famous for skiing and snow. That snow melt in the winter comes down and the creeks all disappear into the ground and fill this aquifer. So we've tapped into this great aquifer for our water. It's very mineral rich, very similar to the water in Kentucky. So we really hit a home run. We were very lucky with that. Our, in fact, our name, Dinner Brick, um, one of the well drillers was staying in this house. And uh, in the winter before his father had been killed, he slipped in the street. Um, his brother had been killed in an industrial accident all within a few months. He was in pretty rough shape, I guess. And it seems like, I don't know what happened, but uh, he got in a shootout with the police and was killed on the front porch of the house. And the front of the house had all these bullet holes, which are, are dented bricks. So out of reference or deference to the uh, well driller, we took a lot of the bricks from the house and built them into the distillery. So the entrance into the distillation chamber all have bricks from this historic home. Uh, we've also gotten in uh, with the... Uh, Ghost, ghost people. So there's a, a woman who's writing a book about ghosts in the West, uh, and she's including us in that. And we've had several uh, ghost movie people and things here to talk to our ghosts. So we have the well driller, the ghost of Ron is here, and also Hugh Moon has been around. It turns out this property uh, is the same property that Hugh Moon actually owned at one time. He had a farm here, and he talked about actually trying to raise uh, sugar cane here in Utah uh, to make rum. So we don't know if he was successful, but he may very well have been raising sugarcane on this very property where we built our distillery. So uh, we are tremendously lucky to have this history, to have the well, uh, and to have everything we have going for us here in Utah of all places. 
So um, where'd you get your distilling equipment? So uh, when I started looking at this, uh, like I said, I've been talking to some of the guys at High West and they were big into Kentucky whiskey. In fact, um, the, the founder of that was a, a blender, Kentucky blender. He really was into blending Kentucky whiskeys. So they were buying a lot of whiskeys and blending at the time. And they suggested that I spend some time and gave me some um, um, uh, references to some of the folks in the Kentucky distilling industry, which is, is bourbon mostly. So this distillation uh, chamber that we have is really a Van Dome uh, bourbon distillation system. So we've got a uh, stripping column, which is the large uh, column on, the, on my left, so be, I guess, on your right. But that's a 28-foot stripping column. We'll run, our, uh, we'll run our distiller's beer through that, and it'll take out some of the water, and it'll take out all the grains and yeast cells and all that and get it clean. And then when we get 500 gallons of it, we put it over in the pot still, and the pot still will finish it off for whiskey and rum. The other column you can kind of see in the back there is a vodka column. So when we make our own green spirit, we'll take it from the pot still and run it back. And that column will get us up over 90% alcohol, which we need for. Uh, so uh, presently, we get most of our grains from the Utah-Idaho border. There's a big growing region up there, and they grow a ton of grain for uh, a lot of the breweries, uh, big, bigger breweries like Budweiser. And there's a big silo, actually, it's got Budweiser on it. And so we get a little bit of that grain for our facility. We've been trying to get some rye. They use rye as a cover crop uh, on, our, on a, a lot of organic, uh, like our organic vineyards. And so I've been working with one of my winery friends to see if we can't harvest that grain that he's using as a cover crop to kill the weeds so they don't have to weed or, or use spray. Um, we get our sugar from Lula Sugar Farm in Louisiana, really about as close as we could find any uh, sugar cane juice. We get uh, turbinado cane sugars. They just basically uh, use a centrifuge and dehydrate the sugar cane juice. When we get it back here, we uh, just rehydrate it with water and make our rum out of it. So it's almost an agricole style rum. We put just a touch of molasses in it to give it a little bit more complexity. Uh, that's also produced by Lula Sugar Farm for us. Yeah, so that uh, um, we built a rick house. So basically our distillery is a rick house. Um, there's no heating or, or cooling out there. So in the summer right now, it's 90 degrees out there. Uh, in the winter, it'll get down to, you know, 40, sometimes even into the 30s. What happens is the, those barrels, when they're hot like this, those, the pores of the wood actually expand and suck alcohol into the wood. And when it gets cold, the, the, the wood shrinks and pushes the alcohol out and it extracts vanillin out of the wood, which is the flavor component you get from a barrel aged spirit. Uh, we're also, again, the, with the antelope red, we're doing this with used Cabernet wine barrels. So it's actually going through the layer of wine residue and back out and pulling some wine essence, where with the whiskey barrel is going through charcoal and back out, which helps clean it. You might pull out any of the uh, tails that we miss or, or maybe even some heads. It'll help clear it. So we use charcoal all the time for cleaning here. We've also uh, installed all of our water lines are, are all copper. It was a great expense to us, but copper is a, a very good cleaning um, component. Uh, so it's, those are all copper. Water lines are all copper because uh, copper will clean, clean, clean everything. I love rum. Uh, National Rum Day is Sunday. So uh, these are some great rums. You can mix and blend and make really cool cocktails. You can, I, I think the tasting with the cheese is going to be fantastic. I'm really excited to get going. Let's, let's, uh, let's do some tasting. Our first rum is your Antelope Island Red Rum. Yeah, I think this is a, a age, I think this bottle is a three year bottle. So it's been in the Cabernet wine barrels from uh, Hell's Canyon Winery in Idaho uh, for three years before we uh, bottled it. And it's a little overproof. I think it's uh, 90 proof, 45% alcohol. Uh, incredible esters and flavors. It's really complex. Um, I've had people come in here and say they don't drink rum, they hate rum, and I give them a shot of this, tell them it's whiskey, and they think it's whiskey. I mean, it is, uh, it's something else. Uh, let's talk about uh, proper pouring of these, and, and, you know, before we get on, let's uh, uh, do an evaluation of how, what we're going to, how we're going to taste with the rums. Okay. I think, um, you know, a glass, number one, uh, there are proper glasses for tasting, and you need to have a glass that, that uh, I generally find a tulip-shaped glass or something will help with the olfactory. Um, if you get the nice, um, I can't remember the name of the glass, but, it, but, it, but it's wider and bulbous at the bottom, and then it comes in narrower at the top. That'll help you get around a lot of the hot alcohol vapor, so you can actually smell the esters that are in there. Uh, and again, with tasting, a lot of your tastes are actually the same esters are going to affect your taste buds, so you can taste them. 
uh, generally, you really need to have a drop of water, literally a drop, but most of the distilled spirits have a layer of oil on the top, and that will prevent the esters from coming out until you put a drop of water or an ice cube in there. Um, again, swirl the glass like you would a wine. Uh, take a look at the legs. The legs should be pretty nice. You'll get some interesting colors when you look at it. Uh, and then the first taste, first alcohol you put on your tongue, generally just try to ignore it because your tongue actually needs to get... Um, uh, the, the alcohol really hits your tongue and the vapor really hits your tongue at first and it's hard to taste after that first total taste. But once your tongue kind of gets numbed a little bit with that alcohol, the second time you put some on your tongue, you should really be able to taste through the front of your tongue, the middle of the palate, and the back of your palate. Uh, I think with the, the red rum, uh, I always pick up a, a really nice um, kind of a sweet fruit in the middle, sometimes almost a cherry note. And back of the tongue, a lot of times a little bit of black pepper uh, up front. Sometimes I get a little vanilla. Just, you know, day to day, your tongue and what's been on your tongue changes what you're going to taste. So I get a taste every day. Mm, there's a lot of vanilla on the nose. Mm. Now, do you suggest that this to be uh, neat or uh, on the rocks? I, you need a drop of water or an ice cube on it to get the esters. Otherwise, that layer of oil will prevent them from escaping so you can smell them. Yeah, just like that. It's perfect. There was a little change. Uh, uh, the vanilla kind of stepped back, and uh, I'm getting a little molasses. Mmm. It's uh, there's a nice sweetness here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. There's very little residual sugar, or almost there. I don't think there is any residual sugar, but yet it has it, it keeps that sweet. The influence on here of the barrels, uh, you know, kind of comes across as you pick up a little bit of that uh, uh, a hint of toastiness to this. Very light, but there's definitely a little toasty. So what I thought would be really fun with this is a uh, brie style. And so I picked, uh, this is uh, Green Hill uh, from Sweetgrass Dairy. And this is a double creme, and, but it's, it's as, as creamy and rich as a triple creme is. It has all of those characteristics with it. A little bit of earthiness that I thought would work out really well. A lot of butter uh, that comes across here. But one of the things it has is a kind of like a sweet cream. And so I thought the butter sweet cream would go really well with the uh, earthiness and, and vanilla molasses. Mm. So originally there's a little bit of tanginess to the to the brie and the rum really takes out that tang and brings in more of that buttery cream so you get almost like a like a little bit of a butterscotch um, sweetness but there's that earthiness that comes in there that really brings out a woodiness uh, to, the, to the rum. Very nice. I should have done this earlier. So this is a, a stave from a whiskey barrel. And you can see the inside of the whiskey barrel is burnt. Yeah. Then you can see how far the, the alcohol penetrates in to extract the vanillin out of the wood. This is a wine barrel stave. So the shape's a little bit different. A whiskey barrel is 53 gallons. Uh, it's a little shorter. The wine barrel's actually got a little bit more uh, surface area and a quite a bit different shape. And you can see all the wine esters, particularly right here where the this piece is. So that rum goes through. The wine only goes a little bit, it penetrates a little ways. So that rum that you're drinking is able to penetrate much farther and pull out the vanilla and, and it goes through these wine esters going each direction. So ends up being quite different than the whiskey barrel stage. And I think a lot of the flavors that you're, you're, you're tasting are coming from that wine barrel. This doesn't come across as a, a lot of alcohol heat. 
This definitely comes across very, very smooth. Um, something that uh, uh, would be a great sipping rum versus uh, having, it's not necessary that you would blend this for the fact that you'd want to cut it down a little bit. This is uh, uh, definitely very palatable, sweet, um, and uh, beautiful nose on it. I mean, there's, there's almost a, a, a scotchish uh, nose that you, you pick up. Uh, maybe a little bit of um, uh, peat out of this. Uh, it's something, something herb, uh, natural, grassy or something that is, is fabulous. It's just really got an interesting nose. Yeah, the grass field come from that agricultural style where we're using that uh, cane sugar, uh, really bringing the grassy note out. Yeah, yeah Antelope Island rum. So this was our first product. Um, Antelope Island is an island in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. Uh, historically, uh, there was a, a ranch out there called the Garfield Ranch. Uh, they they uh, were raising cows out there initially. Uh, then when the buffalo started becoming endangered, there was a, a, a wealthy businessman here who decided to take uh, some of the buffalo and put them out on the island. And so it became a refuge for buffalo. And a lot of the buffalo um, stock uh, that is in Yellowstone and the Yellowstone bird is above Antelope Island. Um, we thought when we did it, we didn't want to do a vodka first because there's a lot of crappy stories to do in vodkas at that time already. And so we thought, well, we're, you know, they're all about the Caribbean and pirates and islands, and we have our own island. So we, we decided to go with Antelope Island. Uh, it has some really, really neat uh, history out there. One of the things that happened, we have a, a rum we're coming out with that's a peach-flavored rum. And the uh, when the Mormons first came here, they thought they'd make Antelope Island a penal colony. And they got their first couple of prisoners, and they rode out there to dump them off on this island. And there was a mountain man living out there. They called him Daddy Stump. And uh, he had peaches. He was making himself peach brandy. So uh, we're going to come up with a Daddy Stump peach flavored rum. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to send you a bottle of that pretty soon. That sounds fun. This is, uh, again, uh, uh, almost 100% uh, cane sugar, uh, just a touch of molasses from uh, Lula Sugar Farm in Louisiana. Uh, and it's just a it's pretty simple product to make, but man, it really is good. It, get some really nice complex flavors. We've gotten several 90 plus awards on this one and gold medals and all of that. I kept an ice cube just in case you had a suggestion on that. Very different. Yeah, it's amazing. You amazing. Have a lot of grains on this. This yeah. is definitely a little more intense in that flavor. Mm. That it's got uh, uh, underlining sweetness in here that is, uh, you know, very characteristic of what you would expect from a rum. It's very clean, you know, it's not, uh, you don't taste a lot of uh, uh, extra flavor in there. There's just a really nice, uh, sweet um, grain flavor. Very nice. Something you would expect from, you know, a, a very nice rum. So uh, not, not uh, I don't really get the alcohol heat out of this at all. Uh, it's very smooth, like uh, like the barreled one, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, cowgirl, and this is their Mount Tam, and and I really love this cheese for a couple of reasons. One, it's a beautiful organic uh, cheese. It's a uh, triple crown, and it uh, uh, has a tremendous amount of really rich flavors to it. And uh, I, that that is kind of the direction I thought is that I would need a little bit more of the butters, of the intensity of the flavors. But again, uh, like the Green Hill, this doesn't have an intensive rind to it.
Wow. The cheese is strong enough to hold up. So I get the rum and I get the cheese. I don't have a lot of uh, one overpowering the other. They come in really close to each other. But what's really interesting is that the saltiness, and there's very little saltiness in the taste, but when you put these two together, you get that little bit of saltiness. So the sweet, salty, uh, like, um, uh, you know, the uh, sea salt caramel thing going on. So you get that a uh, little bit of uh, sweet, you get a little bit of, of salt. Uh, that really is interesting. And I think that it would enable you to uh, enjoy the rum with the cheese a little longer versus uh, having to uh, say, well, you know, one, two little bites are enough. You could really have uh, a nice pairing where you can really extend this because there's a nice contrast between the two. Very nice. And I, I believe that, you know, the combination of where you get your grains, you know, more terroir based, and then of course your aquafilter of the quality of the water that you're working with, I think does really uh, a great attribute to the quality of the rum here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, good raw materials going in is good product coming out, really. Disco nut. Okay, <laughs> well, this will be fun. So this is a coconut flavored rum. Uh, it's 50 proof, so it's only 25% alcohol. Uh, and uh, part of the reason we did that is that the, uh, that the, um, the glitter will, will melt at higher proof. So we had to proof it down a little bit to, to keep the glitter happy. But this is just a fun rum. Uh, it's really easy to drink. Um, pretty heavy on the coconut. Uh, Pretty fun to mix into cocktails or do layered cocktails. Um, just to uh, really good time. We originally we were going to do this for the Pride Week here in Utah, which was in June. And when it was canceled, we came up with this idea to uh, donate some of the proceeds to the Pride Center here because that was their whole year's uh, fundraising, really. So they didn't, they, they don't have any real way to raise funds this year. So trying to help them out a little bit and um, have some fun with this round. So. Uh, be interested to know what you think and uh, see how it tastes with cheese. I have uh, immersed it, swirled it, and uh, it is, uh, it's, it's like watching uh, one of those uh, snow globes uh, that are moving around in a circle. Yeah. Now, because this is flavored, does it require the uh, little splash of water too? It still does. You'll still get that alcohol layering. I think with this, because it's lower proof, it maybe doesn't do that as much, but yeah. Oh yeah, coconut. It's definitely, you know, you got a nice sweet coconut. You don't smell any alcohol whatsoever. It's got very, very clean uh, coconut smell. Wow, that is so nice. I was, I was af afraid that it would be uh, a sugared coconut. Yeah, again, we don't put sugar in our products and we don't use artificial flavors. That's just coconut. Mm. Yeah, so it makes a really nice mouthfeel. is great. It's really coconut, like really true coconut flavor. If you're a fan of coconut, this would be a great little um, after dinner uh, after teeth because it's it's not heavy. Um, it has uh, the nice sweetness to it. I don't taste uh, or or pick up any of the extent uh, alcohol on it. It doesn't have any heat whatsoever on the nose. This is a beautiful. Um, uh, authentic coconut flavor. So uh, I thought because of the uh, coconut, there was, oh, there's so many places that you can go with this. Uh, I don't, I think that this would be one of the most uh, universal uh, of the, of the rums to be able to pair up. You could, you could do the triple crown, you could do the brie, uh, you could do a mild cheddar, uh, you could do a Parmesan, uh, but I chose a uh, 
a two-year-old Gouda. And this is uh, Mareke uh, out of uh, Wisconsin. Uh, she makes raw milk Gouda, which there's not a lot of raw milk Goudas out there. Uh, even coming from Holland, or on 95, 96% all are going to be uh, pasteurized. So working with that, she really picks out a lot of the additional richness and flavors from, uh, from the milk. And this is a two-year version that she does. Not always easy to be able to get. In other words, if you were looking for it and you wouldn't be able to find it. Another good source of that would be Beamster 18 month. Uh, that would probably be as close to what you could get with this. But there is a uh, maple, caramel, uh, there's a little bit of butterscotch, and there's uh, a little bit of a cooked butter in the flavor here. And I thought that those would be really interesting mixing up with the coconut. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, this is, okay, switch this from after dinner aperitif to a uh, after dinner dessert. Uh, there's so much rich butter and, and uh, maple, caramel, butterscotch, coconut. It's not, uh, it's, it's not one or the other, it's all of them together. It's a beautiful balance of flavors. Um, yeah, the, you, wanna, you wanna impress your friends? This is, this is how you do it. A little bit of aged Gouda and this and for dessert and they'll, they'll, they'll talk about you forever on a good way. <laughs> very nice, very nice. So this is our value line. Uh, so our value line spirits we source. So we source this one. This is a U.S. Virgin Islands rum. Uh, so we bring it in high proof, uh, filter it, proof it down with our well water and uh, blend it and bottle it. Um, it's, it's still quite good. Um, it's just very different than from what you've been, been tasting. Uh, it's pretty clean. Uh, we, we do pretty tight cuts on it. We take out all the tails and pretty tight on the heads. Um, I think you'll find it to be still quite tasty, uh, but quite different. It's a little bit lighter, and it's got a little bit more bite on the back of the tongue. But uh, we'll let you see what you think. If you were a, a rum and coke person, this would be the rum for you. I wouldn't use the other ones and put coke in them. They're, they're just well, that's cold. the thing that I was going to ask about was, you know, with the other two, they're, they're not as much blending as they are sipping. So this is... Uh, this is the direction that you're thinking about this, is having this as a good blend? Yeah, pina colada, rum and coke, um, daiquiri, all that kind of stuff. Although I have to say a Hemingway daiquiri with the Antelope Island rum is pretty tasty. You're very right about that being very light. Um, it is um, uh, a little uh, sweet cane, but it's as if, um, um, you kind of let the sweet cane soak in it a little bit so it's not in your face. Uh, there's, yeah. again, no uh, alcohol heat to this. I, I don't notice anything. It just has a, a nice, very light uh, rum aroma. Nothing, uh, nothing overly powerful. Um, I would say that it's a, a pretty average in, in that respect of being uh, not underpowered, not overpowered, just right in the middle. Mm. Yeah. Even though it's sourced, we still run it through the stills again, so we can take out, you know, we take out any heads or tails and keep it really clean. So it's still a high quality product. Wisconsin aging and grading. And this is a, a Wisconsin select. And this is what's known as Harmony. And it is a aged cheddar. Um, that has some very unique characteristics for it. I, I tasted this a little while back and found it to have uh, a little bit of a butterscotch in its predominance with some uh, additional uh, creamed butter. So it's got a really nice sweetness to it. And I thought, you know, as you were saying about this being a good blend, uh, this is something 
that uh, uh, is really minor in its flavor, not like the Gouda, where the Gouda is, it's big and you've got to have something that's going to stand up against it. This isn't, this has got very subtle flavors to it. Mm. It's so hard not to just consume this whole piece because the butterscotch on here and the butter and the cream is just on its own, just fabulous. It picks up a little bit more of the alcohol across the board, but I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think it just did, um, I think what you weren't getting at the beginning with the cheese, you now get more of, this says that it's a rum. You know, before um, it's, it has a, such a nice lightness that I really didn't think, you know, this, I wouldn't say that it's not a rum, but it's a very light rum. So those that are not into, you know, I like to have a little bit of rum flavor. This is really good. But with the cheese, this becomes rum. I mean, it, it really steps up. Uh, some of the sugar canes, the sweetness, the grains, all those come out in a really nice way. Yeah, so, uh, you know, if you weren't able to get harmony, uh, I think maybe, maybe a very young Gouda might work really well. You know, something uh, about six to nine months age would probably do very well. Um, uh, a bandage wrap cheddar would work really well with it. And then um, you could probably go a Parmigiano Reggiano because of the sweetness that you have in there. That would also work out. It would be really interesting to be able to do that. Yeah, so this is uh, this pineapple rum, I think we've gotten the most 91 ratings and we got a 94 rating on us. That was our highest rating ever. Again, uh, real real juice, it's not an artificial flavoring. So hence, you're gonna, you got some uh, sediment in there. You can see that's actually, you know, pulp from the fruit. Uh, we played around with filtering that out and clarifying it, but we lose too much flavor, too much of the mouthfeel. We really like that. So we've kept with that. Um, Jan's one of the um, owners here. She was a, or is a professional golfer. She's in the Golf Hall of Fame now. Uh, she was inducted last summer. Uh, she's from Australia originally. So um, she's uh, been a real fun uh, partner to work with on this project. And she's actually why we're in Florida. She uh, owns a golf course in Florida and has lived in Florida for a number of years. Um, this is, again, the same base rum, the Antelope uh, Island rum. Uh, so we make it in-house, uh, and then we blend it in with the uh, pineapple juice, and uh, you end up with this nice uh, flavored rum that's flavored with actual juice. Mm. This is, again, I think a, a real nice sipping rum, just to sit in the back porch with a chunk of ice in there. And, um, but it's, uh, it's dangerous. <laughs> You can drink a lot of this rum uh, pretty easily. So, and it looks like I can see you have the uh, mango and the passion fruit there as well. You'll have to have to taste those after the program. They're they're quite interesting how different they are. The different flavors that you get, particularly the passion fruit flavors, are really um, complex. It really smells like you just cut open a pineapple. It's that fresh. It's it's not. It's not sugar sweet. Um, it doesn't smell like a Jolly, Ranch, Jolly Rancher. It, uh, it smells just like uh, pineapple does. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely uh, like you are dipping in a slice of pineapple into the rum. There's not a lot of sugar. There's not a lot of anything that you would interfere with that. It's just very, very clean. Very nice. Thanks. Yeah, folks a lot of times think it's going to be sweeter than it is. And it's just, it doesn't, it's sweet, but it doesn't have that like sugary, you know, syrupy sweetness to it. No, it's definitely the sweetness of a natural pineapple, not, not a, a, a sweetness of adding in sugars. So they're very nice. So I thought I'd pair this up with uh, this is the Satori Velvetano uh, Gold, which is a uh, Parmesan. 
And uh, Parmesans are very adaptive. Um, you know, a little different than, you know, we'd get from a Parmigiano Reggiano uh, because the Parmigiano Reggiano would probably have a little bit more of the uh, fruitiness to it, where this has more of the uh, buttery flavors and a little hint of uh, nuttiness, kind of like a, a, a hay style nut, grain nut uh, in here. And so uh, I really wanted something that would be not quite neutral, but something that I think would go really well with the pineapple because um, with this cheese, we actually taste it with uh, uh, freeze dried chunks of pineapple. Perfect. Oh, oh. With the Satori Parmesan, you really get a nice richness of the flavors and it's not overwhelming uh, in its uh, uh, buttery flavors. It's just enough to be able to come across uh, that I think works well with the pineapple. And like I said, we've done freeze dried pineapple, pineapple chunks, things like that with Parmesan uh, before and it works out really well. And, this is no exception. So this again would be a really nice, very, very nice um, little afternoon. Um, just a little something to have after, uh, after lunch. That light. Good. Yeah, it sounds awesome. I can also imagine that this, uh, you know, blends very well with uh, other cocktails. Uh, yeah, so you can make a, uh, uh, it's not Long Island iced tea, but uh, Island iced tea. So if you take a mango, a passion fruit, a pineapple, and a silver shot of each, it's just mm -hmm. really yummy. Put a pineapple garnish in there. Mm. It's, a, it's, a one, it's a one drink drink. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think it would hurt a pina colada either. Yeah. I use it some in cooking as well. Uh, I've used it for uh, marinades on some meats and chicken and, and uh, it's uh, I can, quite good. Um, I could see this, uh, you know, on a, um, uh, like a jerk chicken sauce, a, a, a marinade on there to kind of sweeten it up, sweeten the uh, heat up a little bit, maybe a little bit on a pork as well. Yeah, this is very nice. Makes a really nice glaze, yeah. 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 I think anybody that's looking for a pineapple rum that uh, brings across some nice uh, flavors, I think this would, this is really one that would be very uh, adaptable to a lot of cocktails. And and again, sipping, it's just really nice and pairing up with the cheeses. So, uh, you know, I, I think that you probably could go again with several variations of the cheeses and it'd still be okay because they're... Uh, uh, this isn't something that has a lot of alcohol that's going to interfere. And again, like all of yours, no alcohol heat on these. So they're very approachable. They're very easy to drink um, and you know, very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I appreciate you doing this. This has been fun. And uh, I'm looking forward to going home and playing with some cheeses and some of my spirits. So, yeah. All right. It's Sunday. is National Rum Day. Okay. So, so this is and rums. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good excuse on Sunday to break out the rums. If you haven't had any, uh, this would be a great way. Summertime is the perfect time to be able to create some afternoon cocktails. And you now know that uh, there's some really good cheeses that will go along with it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael. That was great. Much All right. Well, you take care. And uh, thanks again for uh, the great rums and uh, the information. And uh, uh, I hope uh, we can uh, do something again in the near future. That'd be great. I'd love to do it. All right. Anything else that you'd like to say before we run? No, just thanks a lot. That was really fun. And uh, uh, cheers. Have a great day. All right. You too. All right. Cheers and uh, have a good night.